Welcome to the Indie Writer Podcast, where we talk about all things writing and indie publishing. Today, we are excited to talk about writing neurodiverse characters with Hallie Gomez. Hallie writes for children and young adults and works at her independent bookstore. She has written several stories with neurodivergent characters, including her young adult novel, List of Ten. When no one is looking, she sock skates through the house and talks to dogs like they are human. When people are looking, she enjoys reading outdoors and breaking out of escape rooms with her family. Hallie lives in North Carolina with her husband, two boys, and two dogs. Well, we're so excited to have you, Hallie. Welcome. So we just wanted to start off. I know that you've done a few podcasts on this topic, and this is a topic that you're passionate about. I know, Becca, it looks like you added a question that you wanted to kick us off with, so I'll I'll pass that over to you. Yeah, so I just very recently from actually a past guest from this podcast, Danielle De Lorenzo, who's an De Lorenzo, I'm sorry, who's an occupational therapist, um, who was on our um, episode about writing nonfiction that's really close to your heart. She has written a nonfiction book, not about, but it's about it's partly inspired by her autistic son, and um, she recently posted something that taught me the difference between neurodivergent and neurodiverse because until like very, very recently, I was kind of using the terms interchangeably, but I learned that from Danielle that um, neurodivergent is more to refer to an individual and then neurodiverse might describe a group of people that might contain both, both neurotypical and both neurodivergent people. So um, Kelly, maybe you could start us off by talking about well, for you, like, what is the importance of including both neurodivergence and neurodiversity in your work? Um, well, I think it's really important to have um, individuals, uh, neurodivergent individuals, um, in in stories because that's that's how life is. That's how neighborhoods are, schools are, classrooms are, workplaces are. Uh, if you if you really sat down and thought about it, there will be at least one neurodivergent person in your, you know, classroom or workplace. Um, in, in terms of neurodiversity as a whole, it's just part of how society is is made up, um, and I think it's so important to for stories to reflect to reflect everybody's differences, you know, to be um, really to be accurate with the way society is. It's the same thing um, with, I think, religious differences and cultural differences. Um, For me, I think one of the best parts of living in the United States is that it is so culturally diverse because you can, you learn from everybody. Um, so the same thing, you know, the society, you know, your society is is neurodiverse. So I think books should be accurate and represent, you know, the world that we live in. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so speaking of representation, Jackie, that kind of leads into your next <laughs> your next question that you had. Yeah. So I, I know that historically there's been a lot of misrepresentations and oversimplifications of neurodivergent characters in literature. So how as authors, do you think that we can ensure we're creating characters that are really complex and nuanced? Um, This is, yeah, this is a a big thing for me um, and probably for all neurodivergent um, authors. It's, it's harmful to misrepresent and to um, have stereotypes and have flat, characters. Um, you are not just whatever your, whatever neurodivergent, you know, issue that you have, you are so much more. You're, um, so for me, for example, um, I'm a, a wife, a mother, I'm a bookseller. Um, I've been, I'm an events coordinator. I'm a, I used to teach martial arts. I'm a fourth degree black belt. Um, there's so much more to me than just, uh, 
Tourette's syndrome and OCD, which is what I have. Um, so for authors to write about these characters, number one, they have to, they have to be well-rounded because that's how people are in real life. Um, and two, it's so important to do the research and research comes from talking to professionals. Um, it comes from talking to neurodivergent individuals. It also comes from speaking with their friends and family because the character in your story is not living a life by by themselves. They're interacting with other people. And when they interact with other people, those other characters are going to have reactions. So you need to make sure that those reactions are accurate also. And that's why I highly recommend speaking with friends and family too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all really wonderful advice. And I feel like it, it goes along with a lot of topics that we've covered on this podcast, which is just writing experiences that aren't your own and the importance of making sure that you're always doing research. And then also, I imagine that when you're writing experiences that even maybe a version of that is your own, making sure you're still not making that character experience their world the same exact way that you do. So I would love to just you know, as we get into our conversation here about your most recent book, because it sounds like it's doing really well, which I want to congratulate you on. And um, that might give <laughs> our listeners some context as we continue our conversation. Um, so my most recent book, um, it's called List of Ten. It's a young adult novel. Um, it is fiction novel. Um, it's about a boy who has a teen who has Tourette syndrome and obsessive compulsive disorder and anxiety and he's lived with it for 10 years um gone through the um pain and embarrassment and exhaustion um and he can't take it anymore so he makes a list a list of nine things he wants to do to accomplish and number 10 will be commit suicide so it's it sounds and, and i always say this because um does represent issues in real life, um, but it's it's hopeful. He um, meets some friends. He learns to see different sides of life. Um, so it, while it is a, a tough subject, um, there is love and family and friendship and hope in this story too. Going back to your answer before, I think it definitely ties into a lot of our conversations about representation um, and voices movement and so one of the things we've asked um, past guests on similar episodes I guess is you feel like an author needs to like have an experience to write a protagonist to that experience and I think what you said is really interesting because so you talked about talking about other people's maybe neurotypical people's reactions and how mm -hmm. even if you are a neurodivergent author how you might need to speak to people to get like to get authentic reactions. So I think that really kind of puts a new a new spin on that question. So thank you. Mm -hmm. So we mentioned, you know, historically that neurodivergent characters maybe have not necessarily been represented in an honest way or a complex way. And how are you feeling about the world of literature right now? Um, and with the own voices movement? And, and how does that feel to you? Do you feel like there have been more authentic voices uh, raising their stories up and telling these stories? Or do you feel like we still have a, a good bit of work to do? We're, we're getting there. Um, there's still, there's still a, a lot of work to do. Um, there, there's always a lot of work to do in, in just about every mm -hmm. aspect of life, though. It's, it, we're always a work in progress. Um, it, it is encouraging, and I see... Um, I see a lot of agents who are looking for those kind of stories. Um, my agent in particular, like the authors and illustrators that she represent is just, it's like a whole big, beautiful neurodiverse community. Um, and I see also publishers are establishing new imprints for, um, for diversity, which is really great. So it's, it's coming along. Um, I still, I, I think we've all seen in the last, you know, few years, um, 
books that have kind of slipped through where maybe they haven't done enough research because they are um, they have characters that are problematic. Um, so obviously more work that needs to be done, more research that needs to be done, more conversations that need to be done. But I feel that we're having those. So awesome. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like there's been so many just great reading lists. Do you have uh, authors that help inform your work that you look to? Or do you feel like you're paving the way kind of within your niche right now? Or what do you read when you want to to be inspired to create these stories? Um, so these, so stories like List of Ten, my my biggest two go-tos and, and um when when I did my author box, you know, unpacking, um, I put the book in between these two books and it just like I started to cry. Um, so John Green is one, um, Turtles All the Way Down, and then Jennifer Niven, All the Bright Places. Just um t- to me just speaks the world. Um, they are so well done, so heartfelt, um, so well researched, clearly so well researched. The, the, the stories themselves, the plots are fabulous. The characters are well developed. Um, and I find this in, in all of their books. Um, uh, but those are my definite, um, when I'm looking for like an emotional, heartfelt contemporary YA, those are my first two go-tos. I'm glad you mentioned Turtles all the way down because I was hoping we could talk about it. And it kind of hits on some of the points you mentioned too, where, you know, it's not not about her OCD, but it's not only about her OCD. There's a whole mystery around it. And then, you know, I really don't want to spoil, so I don't know if we want to take this out, but I love that it ends hopefully, but not everything's fixed and everything's better. I love that. That, that's one of the things, um, that's one of the things that I loved about it. And I, I did list of 10 the same way. Um, and another book, not, it's not, doesn't have a neurodivergent character, but, um, the book heroine from Mindy McGinnis, um, she does the kind of ends it on the same way. Um, life doesn't always have, you go through this you go through this ordeal and you see a doctor or you do this and then it's all fixed. Um, There are some, like with the, you know, the character in Turtles all the way down, she will always have OCD. So there's no magic cure. There's no magic medicine. It's part of her life and will always be part of her life. And I think that's one, one thing that's important to educate the public about you know even if you let's say you go to therapy or you take medicine it's still not a forever cure um so that's one of the things i loved about that story also is it's hopeful but there's no like magic you know magic cure or anything oh that's great because i i've read turtles all the way down as well it's been a couple years but it's definitely stuck with me and we've talked a lot about mental health on these podcasts and Becca and I have talked about how our, our mental health, you know, what we live with has impacted our characters. And as we're, as you're talking, I'm just, do you feel like a lot of the um, hero's journey or save the cat or any of those traditional story structures, do you feel like it, it kind of serves when you're starting to write neurodiverse characters or do you feel like, like we need to, as a society, start to explore um, story structures differently? Um, I don't, I don't follow those story structures because I don't feel that they fit the stories that I write. So the first book that I ever wrote was a middle grade and which is in a drawer right now, um, a middle grade adventure story. And they find this box and they go on a quest and find a treasure and, you know, boom, everybody's rich and happy. Um, but that's that's not even for middle grade. That's that's not how the, how life works. And even if you're writing a fantasy, um, 
I think it's great to, you know, have a big adventure and have conclusion. Um, but it's life is not always set out like that. Mm -hmm. So, um, the character, like in the hero's journey, the character, um, you know, has difficulty and they, um, they find their quest and, you know, they change, you know, um, you know, they realize, you know, whatever the issue was and they change and, you know, they grow from that. Um, and that's, and that's fabulous. And for the right plot, I think that's perfect for my writing, for example, and maybe because I write neurodivergent characters and also dealing with mental health, it's, it's a lifelong journey. And mm -hmm. we're seeing that a lot with the pandemic too, you know, the, the mental health and um, depression and all and social anxiety and everything. It's kind of like a roller coaster. It kind of goes up and down. And I don't think it's, it follows the traditional hero's journey path. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? So I know that was a very like long answer, but I think. No, that made a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay, good. <laughs> no, it did. And I feel like I'm hearing that conversation more and more. I don't know if you are, Becca, just about, you know, westernized storytelling in general and how we need to kind of branch out. I'm reading this really great book right now. I, well, I hesitate to say it's really great because I'm not that far into it. But so far, I'm loving it. It's called uh, Meander Spiral Explode. And it's a craft book, but it's about taking... Um, you know, other shapes from nature, other kind of patterns to inform your writing and, and really like, you know, your character doesn't need to go on this major arc and then change at the end. They can like have moments where they kind of go in and come back out and, and just kind of playing with, you know, what that looks like. Yeah. I'm just really love that, that folks are embracing different ways to tell story to see what comes out of that in the next few years. Yeah. Yeah. I'm excited to see too. I think it's a really cool, I think it's really cool to think about how, like how that's related to people's brains being different. Like not everybody processes the world in the same way. Um, and that's, that's just how the world is. Um, right. But I'm wondering from a craft perspective, if you have any, like anything to share particularly about what story have worked for you or like what alternatives people could look into. If they're looking for something that fits their characters and their plots a little better. I'm really not not very traditional in that sense. You know, I've I've tried to follow and when I when I write when I write a book I have um like an Excel spreadsheet like and I kinda have it laid out in the three act structure. Um so, you know and I I loosely fit everything in um but if it doesn't fit it doesn't fit if it fits the way the story is going then i i go with that i go with how how the story fits um the character does need to grow the character does need to you know have um highs and lows and setbacks and and wins yeah, I I I think I just follow the story. I let the the characters tell me and if now's not the right time that they need to, you know, jump into, you know, the dark side of the soul, it's not going to happen. So, yeah, I would like my suggestion would be just let your characters tell you the story. You know, just let them take you on the journey. I love that. And I, I would just love to know about your process. You know, what does that look like for you? Do you do you feel like you usually have a pretty clear character in your mind before you start? Or how does a project begin for you? Pro they're all a little bit different. Um, sometimes, like, the ideas come to me, you know, in at different times in different ways. Um the the newest I'll start with the newest idea that I had that just will not get out of my brain um and I'm very happy about it. it's um I did like a for um SCB uh, SCBWI Carolina's the ignite the spark I don't know if you've done that but I did it last month and I just wrote a scene about a girl and her grandmother and 
it just kind of took off. So I will get an idea, whatever that idea is. Sometimes it's character. Sometimes it's plot. I, I wrote a thriller, um, a young adult thriller, and that was a little bit more plot driven. Um, so I'll have my idea and then I just start taking notes, you know, whatever, whatever comes to mind, you know, sometimes it's just an idea for a scene. Sometimes it's an idea for, um, like just a very general storyline, you know, in one of my many notebooks. And I know that you guys have many notebooks too. Um, and then once I kind of can flesh out a story a little bit, then I start outlining and drafting on paper. So I'm really old school that way too, um, paper and pen for my first draft. Um, I get it, you know, when I get it all done, then I type it on the computer and that'll be like my first, my first revision. But how satisfying, like to get to type it all out. And I don't know, I wish I had that, that ability because I, yeah, I've never been, I can scratch, you know, a scene on paper, but then I have to go ahead and transcribe it real fast. So I admire folks that can can write a whole first draft without transcribing. <laughs> Otherwise, I would spend, you know, like three months on chapter one just editing. So this way, it, it kind of forces me to get the story out and not edit. Mm-hmm. Can we talk a little bit more about research? I know you mentioned, um, like, looking at experts and speaking to people, but... Mm-hmm. I wonder if you have any advice for speaking to people about their neurodivergence in a sensitive, compassionate way and not being like, you are my research topic and I'm going to write about you, (laughs) you know? Yeah, that that would be a little off-putting. So there, and I hate to say Twitter because Twitter's such a scary place, but but online, there's um, there's a few websites, like there's one called A Novel Mind, um, and there are some other websites, um, We Need Diverse Books, that you can kind of reach out. Um, and just by reading, too, and you see, you can see who neurodiverse, or neuro, like the neurodiverse community, um, and I would just reach out to them and say, you know, hey, I'm writing a book you know, would you, or do you know anybody I can speak with? Because I want to make sure that my characters um, are accurately represented. Um, There are some people I have on my website, but there are some authors that will do like sensitivity reads. So you can always check with them. Um, I, you know, if somebody wanted to, to talk to this, you know, I mean, this is just how I feel. If somebody wanted to talk to me about writing, a character with Tourette or OCD, I would be very happy to talk to them because the way I think if they don't have anybody to talk to, are they going to write a character that's harmful? And I would be more than happy to spend my time to make sure that is accurately represented because kids, you know, I mean, kids and adults, but uh, you know, you, you want to make sure, especially in today's society that, you know, kids have, all the accurate information and there's no stereotypical behavior going on um, just so we can all learn to, you know, accept each other. So yeah, yeah. I would definitely, you know, search, search the internet um, and, and find authors. It seems like a big part of that is just intentionally expanding your reading list, right? So you can reach out to those authors, but you can also make sure you're you're reading books by neurodivergent authors as well. So like if if someone is, you know, neurotypical, obviously we all want to create a, a neurodiverse world, but I assume that a lot of stories are stronger if the central protagonist, you know, that the author relates to the central protagonist. Do you have an opinion on that, on, you know, own voices work? And is it important to you that when a character is is a neurodivergent that they're written by a neurodivergent author? I know this is a this is a very hotly debated topic, and I have to say, and and I can speak only for Tourette and OCD because that's what I know. Um, there are there are more now in the past, you know, probably five years, um, 
middle grade and young adult books about Tourette syndrome. When I was growing up, there were zero. I mean, if there were books, it was all nonfiction medical. So now that I've read five books, you know, those five books that are written out, now what do I do? So um, I, I would encourage anybody to write neurodivergent characters if that's what they want to do, but it has to be done with the research and it has to be, it has to be reviewed by somebody who understands. Mm -hmm. So not by your agent who, you know, doesn't know or an editor who doesn't know. But I, I mean, I think we need the books out there. And if it's done right, my personal feeling is it doesn't matter who does it. But just let me just say, though, I'm talking about Tourette only because it's it's such a it's such a rare topic. It's such a rare disorder. Um, so something that's like, um, let me just say anxiety, because, you know, that's a lot more common. It's easier to find an author that has anxiety than it is to find one that has Tourette. Does that mm -hmm. make sense? Um, yes. But the books are equally as important, you know, with to have characters with anxiety and to have characters with Tourette. Um, and I, I would hate to limit for for kids. You know, I would hate to limit their options. Um, but again, I, you know, have to stress a million times over how important the research the research is. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Now I have like three questions. Let me see if I can <laughs> bring them all. <laughs> so, or like three things that makes you think of is like one, like I totally get what you're saying about not about not limiting books, but also like then the idea of like if a book happened to hit it big, which would be great, but then like the author does not have that experience, and then there are all of the authors who have lived that experience thinking like well, why is it my book the one that <laughs> that made it you know so I can see absolutely that yeah and and that 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 author would be ridiculed and um canceled and you know um you know and again I I don't I don't know that I feel like that about other like again anxiety um you know I think I think it's easier to find people who have anxiety to write about anxiety. Um, and it's the same thing with cultural differences too. Yeah. yeah and I'm Jewish and um, there are not, at, yeah. And there are not as many Jewish authors as there are Catholic authors, you know, Christian authors, just because it's, it's not the majority religion. I, it just really comes down to research, you know, making sure you have it right. Um, and it, it, it's such a tough thing because I, I really can't, I really wouldn't want to speak for, um, let's say, black authors or Muslim authors um, because I'm not in their position. Um, so I wouldn't want to speak for them. I'm, I'm just speaking from my point of view. Um, and there are authors who, so Dusty Bowling, who writes middle grade, she wrote um, insignificant life, insignificant events in the life of a cactus. Her, her second uh, secondary character has Tourette. She doesn't have Tourette. She, her husband does. She did a fantastic job. Um, there's a new YA that came out last year called um, Kiss and Repeat. Same thing, the author, Heather Truitt, she doesn't have Tourette, her son does. She did a fantastic job. It's important to get those stories out there, I I think. Does, you know, again, I'm just speaking for my own my own little world, though. That makes total sense. And, like, I, I definitely hear what you're saying. So, like, if the if there is an, aren't a wealth of authors who maybe can identify with this one specific neurodivergence, then it's important to elevate any kind of story that helps spread awareness. But maybe if there's, if it's something where there, it, there are many talented authors that fit that, then the, their book should obviously be elevated um, whenever possible. Is that kind of. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. And, and again, I, you know, I, I would definitely go with the neurodivergent author first. Um, but again, that's not always possible. You know, I just, I just think it needs to be, you know, needs to be accurate. When you talked about the woman who wrote about the secondary character with her, and that made me think maybe a pitfall on the other side is if you are telling neurotypical authors you cannot write a protagonist like that you have not experienced <laughs> the same <laughs> the same life with them. Um, I think that kind of lends itself more. Obviously, that author avoided this, but to kind of making those characters less whole or less um, complex, like it's just the you know the quirky sidekick friend with <laughs> with a mental illness or like the you know you know like more of a stereotype when we're telling people that they can't they can't um, make them the main character. So I can see that side of it too. Yeah, a um. I mean, a, a good story in general, the the main character and the secondary characters should all be, you know, full of depth and well-rounded. If you, you know, have a neighbor that you just see walking the dog and, you know, that's it. But if they're an integral part of the story, they should, you know, you should be able to tell their life. That's how, that's how much detail you have created for them. Um, and... In Dusty Bowling's book, she she did a fabulous job, and it's it's clear that she did her research. Um, and he, the character is is you know he has his own life. I mean, he could have his own book. That's how much depth um, and emotion and you know his own personality that she put into that story. That's awesome. Well, yeah, thank you so much. I know that's not an easy, <laughs> that, that conversation is one that's swirling all around us right now. And I think we're all just trying to wrap our heads around how we feel about every single part of it while also making sure we're, we're writing in respectful ways and, you know, doing what we all should be doing right now. So are there any craft books or anything that have helped with your process of just like fleshing out a story? I imagine things like, you know, just developing developing well-rounded characters um what does that process look like for you my new number one favorite um person in terms of craft is donald moss um his he has the breakout novel um but he's he also does with um it it's like a like an editorial company um it's called free expressions and he will do seminars, um, like two and a half hour seminars on all sorts of different topics. Um, and it's, it's like $40, I think. And he's been doing them on zoom. It is, I highly, highly recommend it. Um, he just goes into so much depth and really, um, Oh, drills down so much about, excuse me, about characters. Like he'll pick a specific topic and go on that, but he's done characters. He's done um, mysteries. He's done multiple point of view and, you know, having them relate, you know, they're like, you have to, you have to have like a, a common thread running through just, um, just absolute setting everything it's he's my number one go-to for his book and for the the seminars um is he the one that wrote emotional craft of fiction is that was that one of his books i don't know i'm not sure i know his biggest one is the breakout novel um but i, I also love stephen king's um on writing uh not just for the whole like don't ever put an adverb in your story. Um, but he's so, and, and I just happened to watch a, a, like kind of a compilation of interviews with him just the other day. Um, but he, he, as he's giving you some craft advice, he goes back and talks about, um, the beginning, you know, when he submitted story after story and, 
um, had so many rejections that you know, he nailed him to the wall and the nail fell. And so what did he do? He got a bigger nail, you know, so somebody like Stephen King, that's how he began. I find it really encouraging for the rest of us. You know, there is hope. There is hope. Yeah, I just listened to On Writing. He narrates the audiobook version and I hadn't read it in years. Oh, wow. So I, I just listened to it again. But one thing that he said really stuck with me and he was just talking about how for all of his books, he makes sure to like, complete the first draft within six months because if he takes longer than that he's suddenly not the same person that he was when he first had this idea for this story and it was just very interesting because I try to imagine myself going back right now and trying to write a story that I started four years ago and I'm like it's it's totally true I would not approach a story the same way and so that's been something that I've had in my head of like okay we got to get this draft done in six months just so it's like it doesn't have to be done but it needs to be you know the idea on paper at least so that like a little time capsule <laughs> yeah that's good because I I need a deadline I need to give myself a deadline so that's that's a that's a good tip so funny what jumps out at you of writing books that you know you've read multiple times you just when you hear what you need during that one read um Hallie how long does it take you to do your first handwritten draft usually um probably about like if I focus on that and and nothing else like I don't have any um other like writing projects or um editorial projects um I would say I can do it in about three months. Now that I started working full time, it might take me five months. <laughs> but yeah, normally about three months for the first draft. And then, you know, the like between the revisions and sending to my critique partners and revising again and sending it back, um, it could be about a year for the whole for the whole thing. And this might be a sensitive topic, and so I'll share my experience first, but I also have OCD, and it can really slow me down in my in my writing and my drafting. Um, things like needing to, well, I just worked on footnotes for a non-fiction project, um, and just checking those footnotes was, I mean, probably my <laughs> obsessive compulsive mind there, so <laughs> is there... <laughs> Anything you could share about how um, your OCD or your stress affects your process? For the OCD, I think that's one reason um, that I do the first draft on paper. So that I, otherwise I just, I get fixated on, you know, certain sentences and I have to get it right. And um, so at least I can get the story out um, and then go back and, and do that. With the Tourette, actually, um, you can't see because my hands are down here, but um, it does affect my hands a lot. So sometimes, and I was just, I was just telling my boss this the other day, um, sometimes I end up having to do like this kind of typing instead of using my hands. And, and I told her, I said, I'm better than that. You know, I took typing. I can use all 10 fingers, but sometimes it just doesn't work out. So that kind of slows me down a little bit too. Have you found any tools that, that help you? I know, I know there are a lot of authors now that are using, you know, voice to text and things like that. Have you explored any of those or do you have any recommendations for listeners who maybe are just trying to, um, you know, figure out other tools that might work in their practice? Um, I haven't done the voice to text. Um, I, one of the local Charlotte authors, um, she does voice to text. She, she had a stroke when she was a baby. Um, so she doesn't have the use of her right hand. So she does, that's how she does all her books. And I haven't tried that. I just, um, the biggest thing actually that, and this helps in all areas of my life. Um, I, I do yoga. Um, and I stopped for, like, I used to go to a studio and then the pandemic, you know, and I tried a couple online and it just wasn't, it did, it just didn't fit. It just didn't feel right. But I just found these new videos with, um, a teacher that I love. And so that, that just kind of helps calm me in all areas of my life. Um, stress like stretches out my muscles because sometimes they'll, 
you know, from the Tourette, they'll get, um, they'll get tight and sore. Um, so that, that's probably my go-to is yoga. Yeah. I love hearing that. And I think Becca, we talk about that a good bit, just like it doesn't need to be a specific writing practice, just whatever has helped serve you in your writer life, I think is great to talk about. I would love to just hear any last advice that you have for folks or any, um, you know, if you have, if there are maybe neurodivergent authors who are listening, who maybe are nervous about, um, you know, writing, writing a protagonist, or if you just have any words of wisdom to share before we jump off, we'd love to hear them. Well, definitely the, the publishing world is opening itself up to neurodivergent authors and neurodivergent characters. So that is very promising. Um, but, but I have to say, um, really the, the biggest thing, and, and we can all relate this to our own lives, but um, the, the publishing world, um, it's extremely subjective. So while we all have books that we love, and then we all have books that we don't love, um, it's the same with agents, and it's the same with editors. Um, and I had, um, I got a response from one agent when I was querying for list of 10, um, and she hated, like, she wrote back an email and hated everything about it, every single thing about it, and told me nobody would like it. And then um, I met my agent at a, at a SCBWI conference, and she loved every word and didn't change a thing, um, and then sold it, and, you know, it's published. Um, so. And, and it's really hard when you're writing such a personal story, but just the biggest thing to keep in mind is not everybody likes everything and just make sure that you find the person who does love it. And that person is out there. Sometimes it just takes a little bit to find them. Well, I'm sorry you had that experience. I feel like that's, that's a bit, yeah, a bit aggressive for an agent to say no one will ever like I I don't, I've never heard that before so that hmm, hopefully that agent is uh you know <laughs> not having great relationships <laughs> with her clients I assume <laughs> um yeah I don't I don't know um my my only and and I kind of I mean I talked with my with my critique partners about it a lot and the only thing that that really I could see was kind of a trigger is the book is about suicide and that mm -hmm. that's not an easy subject. Um, and maybe she had something in her personal life and it was too mm -hmm. close to home. Um, and I would never fault anybody for, you know, not wanting to read a story that is going to bring up bad memories or is going to trigger them. Um, so I, I, I just have to put it off that it was just for some reason, it was just a little too personal for her and it, the story just didn't work for her. Yeah. I, I remember when I was, this is not the same at all, but it, when I was querying my first dystopian novel, I definitely got really snarky replies. Like I want nothing to do with a dystopian novel right now. You're like, Oh, well I get that. <laughs> yeah. Maybe just to thank you. No, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Thanks. No, thanks. Um, <laughs> Well, Hallie, before we let you go, could you tell everyone just uh, where to support you, where to buy your books, and then also how to keep up with what you're working on next? Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I have a website, HallieGomez.com, um, and I am on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram, um, uh, Hallie Gomez or Hallie Gomez Author, um, easy to find me. Um, my My books are available at on um, any bookstore. Um, the new paperback came out this Tuesday. You, I don't think you saw it, Becca, big different from the, the hardcover. Um, I always do encourage independent bookstores, um, of course. And if you want to get the book at Park Road Books in Charlotte, I will be happy to sign it and personalize it if you want. So you can just order it from their website. Damn it. I was just there two weeks ago. <laughs> 
<laughs> oh really? Oh man! I probably saw you. I probably yeah, was, saw you. Well, no, there. I wasn't event. I wasn't at an event. I was just shopping. I was just oh, okay. walking to shopping the bookstore. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, that sounded fancier than it was. No, I was just shopping. Um, That's okay. Well, this has <laughs> been such a pleasure. And yes, please, if you're in Asheville, ever you know, shoot me an email. I'd love to meet up for a, a coffee. Um, oh, when yes. it's safe to do so. Thanks for listening to the Indie Writer Podcast. We hope you enjoyed this episode and will subscribe to hear our future episodes. We want to thank the Writing Block community for the continued support. You can find us on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or at writingblock.com, no K. Remember to subscribe, share, and tell your friends. Thanks, everyone, and happy writing. <laughs>